folks, as Ranga said in the morning, the idea is to make the day interactive. While we certainly have some presentations, videos, demos to share with you, but we also want you to get as many opportunities as possible to ask questions, highlight concerns, share any feedback. Uh, we have a 30 minute uh, uh, slot now before we break for tea. Uh, we'll use the next 30 minutes for a Q and A with uh, Vishal, Ranga, and Praveen. So over to all of you for any question that you might have. The mics are there in front of you. You just need to press the "Look at me" button. Uh, please put your name into the mic, and uh, we'll have the next 30 minute session for this uh, for this Q and A. Yeah, hi, uh, Vishal Sandeep here from Middlewise. Thanks for the time. Uh, just one question. Uh, as you mentioned on your starting note that you are seeing some early signs of cautiousness. Is it coming from BFSI or it is coming from across the sector in the region or uh, you are just seeing it in some pockets of geographies? Uh, so that is question number one. And question number two, uh, uh, which is there, is that if you see our acquisitions in last three, four years since Lodestone, lot of margins have been uh, diluted there. So uh, I understand that you would have acquired those, done that acquisitions for skill sets and for cross-selling and other benefits. But your in what does your internal evaluation say is that, uh, is it okay to dilute those uh, margins there and are you getting benefits out of it which is compensating for it? So what is your early evaluation of all those acquisitions in last two, three years? Thanks. Uh, the uh, On the first question, uh, Uncertainties, they are generally client specific. Uh, so far, what we see is uh, not anything very broad, but uh, um, across industries uh, in certain pockets, we see some of these, in, uh, these uncertainties. The, uh, on your question about uh, MA, we uh, continue to uh, look at um, uh, investments and acquisitions as a, um, as a mechanism to bring in uh, next generation capabilities, new capabilities, new talent, new technologies. Um, specifically with regard to Lodestone, see at the time that it was done f four years ago or whenever that was, uh, it was done as a mechanism to elevate the level of our conversations with clients. Uh, not so, it was not so much for the consulting business by itself, but it was to establish the consulting business as a mechanism, like you said, of cross-selling and bringing it into other areas. So even though the business itself is dilutive, it does have downstream effect of creating additional demand and, and of elevating the conversation with the clients. This is an area that, uh, um, I mean, our consulting business um, saw some, uh, we declined in Q1, as Ranga talked about, and that decline in Q1 um, basically was uh, a big part of the uh, decreased performance that we saw in Q1. So even though both in the existing business and in the new business, we had great growth. The fact that consulting declined like that uh, was a uh, was one of the big drags. And we said that we put uh, Rajesh in charge of, of consulting. He's based in Paris, so about a uh, little bit more than two-thirds of our consulting organization is in Europe. Uh, this is the, ex, the former Lord's. I, I expect that uh, over time, uh, we will evolve consulting towards much more of the strategic design consulting um, as well um, in, to be a tip of the spear is what we call it, to help elevate our conversations with our clients and to help uh, uh, create downstream opportunities. And in that, if consulting itself has a somewhat uh, dilutive effect on the margin, I think that it will be more than compensated for by the overall uh, effect uh, that it has. So. I have to share that uh, Deepak, who is here, uh, his team recently analyzed these various options around consulting and came to the same conclusion. So we revisited this same question that you asked just about the, over the last two months and have come to the same conclusion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ananta from Credit Suisse, uh, thank you for the presentations, uh, Vishal and Praveen and Ranga. Uh, so Vishal, you, you know, uh, gave us an update on uh, the various pieces of the strategy that you had uh, highlighted when you joined and where we are in terms of the progress. Are there any areas which have particularly disappointed you? I think that 
in a large institution in a large uh, culture uh, in a in a well established industry with its own ways of working change is always uh, harder and and slower than it than it seems um i have actually been quite happy with the rate at which we have uh, made progress uh if you look at some of the more structural initiatives like introduction of automation into our services and the adoption of that automation uh the success of the mana platform as a commercial entity not just in our service of automating our existing um service line work but also in becoming a software platform in its own right on which new kinds of applications and process renewal work can be done and you'll see more on that later that has been quite amazing to see how quickly that has been adopted and uh, the thing that it makes me the most proud of the last two years when we launched something like 54 or 55 initiatives to transform the company over the last two years but the one that singularly brings me the most pride is the zero distance uh, which is to create a culture of innovation across the company and that is something uh, that has uh, been um, a great source of strength and and pride on the negative side i would say um praveen talked about this many of the processes and the systems that we have are quite old uh it will take a while to evolve that um and uh, some of the the thing that i find now two years after uh, being in this industry is the kind of conversations that we have with clients are still not strategic not very high level uh, we by and large are these uh, you know an industry of procurement it oriented kinds of conversations which are largely rfp driven cost driven and so on and uh, it is something that i have accepted that and we are transforming that from within but that is something that has been a source of uh, um, you know unhappiness uh, that i wish we had the ability to have much more strategic conversation now we have started that uh, but it is uh, it is at a relatively small number of clients i would say approximately 50 clients out of our more than 1000 clients where we have uh, really elevated the conversations to the very strategic levels by using some of the uh, new areas of of engagement but by and large the conversations continue to be uh, and this is the case with the entire industry this is not only specific to infosys so that is an area that i uh, i look back on the last two years as an area that i wish we had made uh, you know more progress on thank you uh yeah hi uh, uh vishal this is nitin here from uh, investec uh, uh with reference to the uncertainty that you were talking about how are you seeing that impact the uh, deal funnel and the rate at which closures of deals happen uh, is the sales cycle uh and the second one was on attrition um how much of the attrition is uh, really involuntary over the overall or is it more involuntary than voluntary the um, the we continue to see a um, a healthy deal pipeline and um, our performance um, both in terms of market share as well as the overall deal pipeline continues to be strong uh, there we have been on a very good trajectory the last few quarters and i expect that this will continue to be the case uh, however we have to um, uh, be cautious that the large deals even though we have one significant number of them in the last few quarters and we continue to do so um they take time to ramp up and immediate pop stick and uh, that is something that we have to to deal with um in terms of attrition the this area continues to be an area of uh, great focus for us the um we are not doing any if you are imply uh, i think in voluntary Yeah, I think involuntary attrition is somehow a code name for a lay- layoff or something, right? Uh, so we are not doing any layoffs. Uh, the, um, the there is no involuntary attrition like that. I, this is a I, I don't know why people use such. I guess obsequious is the word. Uh, <laughs> there was a pun there. The uh, uh, no, so we are not doing any layoffs or anything of that sort. Uh, uh, we continue to focus on, as Praveen said, the high performer attrition. um we have uh, worked on an elaborate mechanism to identify the high performers uh, they are not just the ones whose managers say they are high performers but they truly are high performers so there is a subset of our company uh, where which are which we believe are extremely uh, valuable and uh, i mean every infosion is valuable but in particular there is a group of high performers that we want to focus on and uh, i would expect that that attrition in the high performer will continue to be 
continue to improve, uh, meaning continue to decrease. And um, so, I mean, we are doing a lot of fundamentally new kinds of things. So a lot of our employees continue to be in high demand. Infosys always had this situation. There are times where, I mean, people who teach design thinking at Infosys, for example, get six times improvements in their salaries from competitors and things like that. And our view on that is that go ahead, you know, we'll create more this kind of a thing. So. Hi, uh, this is uh, Sandeep from IFL. Uh, I have a question on uh, the automation. Lately, we've seen almost every IT services company, every large IT services company, uh, showcasing their automation initiatives, right? The instances are a lot more uh, in the past couple of quarters. I wanted to get your sense on, have you seen the commercials on projects or deals where you are entering into automation and which have an automation component worsening over the past one year? Or is it that automation projects are still really small in the overall scheme of things and every vendor has been able to uh, have good commercials with the clients? So that's a very good question. In fact, we have a um, uh, Ravi and Sandeep and Mohit will be here later. We'll talk about some of these and Sudhir will have a dedicated session on this. So I imagine they'll cover more there. Maybe I can give a quick overview. The uh, uh, Everyone talks about automation because it is the future of the industry. There is no doubt about it. Uh, I believe that we are um, ahead of others, but this is not something to be particularly proud of or sit on the laurels um, around. We um, we believe that what we are doing with MANA is ahead of others in the industry, both here in India as well as other parts of the world. Um, uh, the uh, Sudhir can talk more about that later. Uh, we have done extensive work in bringing many different kinds of AI technologies uh, to to the world of automation. And uh, the un one of the unique things about MANA is that uh, we are applying it to far more larger class of problems and far more complex class of problems, including application maintenance and things like that that require a lot more mental work. I will refuse to use the word cognitive because these days everything is cognitive, even inventory is cognitive. Um, the, um, uh, so, but much more complex human brain power requiring um, kind of work that we are doing with MANA and Sudhir will have some examples of that. So it's a highly differentiated thing that we are doing and uh, maybe Sandeep can talk about this later on. The kind of pipeline that we see in MANA is both around uh, uh, existing, bringing MANA to existing work, and Sandeep and Ravi will talk about this, uh, as well as in completely new kinds of applications like the digital farming that we have outside or airplane balancing and things like this. In terms of the existing business uh, being affected by MANA, yes, we do bring MANA into uh, large deals. Uh, all other companies with their own uh, automation toolkits more or less do the same. Um, I think it is inevitable because the kind of cost pressure that we have in these large deals, because the clients themselves are under cost pressure uh, because of digitization and the disruption that that causes, the uh, uh, competition is fierce, um, and the automation-led uh, improvements in uh, uh, in cost efficiency have, have become more prominent. So this is like a triple whammy that hits large deals and that we need to uh, respond to. Um, so we believe that MANA can help bring enough of a productivity improvement to differentiate the kinds of, uh, of, of, of costs and so forth. So that would apply to both large deals that we apply, that we go for, as well as many of our existing larger programs where MANA can eat away some of the manual work. Um, and, uh, but but the correspondingly, there is a uh, even bigger uh, opportunity with applying MANA for new kinds of applications that we continue to be very excited about. But I think that on automation and so forth, probably more when... Uh, uh, Ravi, you want to add something to what I just said? Yes, sir. I'm going to cover that. So Ravi will cover this in his session, and then, of course, uh, later on, I think after lunch, we have a dedicated session with Sudhir. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Vishal, you made an interesting, uh, you know, comment that, uh, you know, some of your business segments are breaking them up into smaller businesses of 500 to $700 million. Now, uh, there's a growing sense about, you know, new companies, startups coming in and disrupting because they're more nimble and more agile. So are there any specific areas where you've taken these initiatives? And could you get us a sense of, you know, who are these companies whom you're fighting against? Are these global companies? Are these smaller companies? So just a sense of which areas and what's the competition like out there? 
maybe uh, Praveen and Mohit uh, Sandeep Ravi can add to this. I'll give you my perspective, which is very clear and somewhat different than the conventional perspective. Uh, we don't set ourselves up because of what somebody else does or some, whether it is a startup or a large company. We are simply doing this uh, for two very basic reasons. Um, we want to expand our bandwidth. We want to improve our effectiveness and agility uh, in responding to opportunities. And we are doing it to better serve our own, uh, what we see are our opportunities and uh, our ways of addressing those opportunities. We are not doing this because anybody else, uh, we don't have any consultants helping us out on creating the setup and things like that. The um, the reason for the five to seven hundred million dollar general guideline around creating a sub-segment uh, with the PNL and so forth is that uh, it gives us bandwidth, it gives us scalability, it gives us isolation and accountability of individuals. Um, this could be a, a um, anywhere from a, a handful to a couple dozen clients um, that um, that you would have one leader for. So it gives us to to the, to the three of us as well as. Um, Mohit and Sandeep and Ravi, the ability to zoom in on the particular needs of a particular cluster of clients. Every large-scale system uh, in the universe is a distributed one, a decentralized one, so this is basically what we are doing. Do, do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, hi, this is uh, Pankaj from GM. Um, just a question on the uh, last couple of years while you have been bringing a lot of changes in terms of new and renew how this has helped us in terms of gaining market share within our clients uh, any sense if you can give uh, you know either in terms of uh, uh, of uh, the wallet share gain that we have seen what has really driven this maybe top 10 top 50 whatever uh, slicing you want to take yeah the uh, i mean the three main ones that come to mind is the that are quantifiable is the top account growth uh, it is the growth in the for example the top 10 top 25 uh, accounts it is the growth in the number of 100 million dollar accounts it is the growth in the large deal wins which is a direct result of differentiated approaches that we bring in uh, it is also in the the renewals of our existing programs without without rfps and so forth so all these are very tangible, quantified ways in which the strategy, the differentiated strategy, um, has been uh, uh, has been showing re results. Yeah, I think uh, last year uh, our lot deal wins in FI 16 was about 40 percent more than uh, lot deal win in FI 15. So that's a clear indication. Uh, average revenue per top 10 clients also has significantly increased. Uh, and in the last uh, last year, again in quarter four. Uh, our growth in the top 10 and top 25 accounts was uh, much higher than the Infosys average growth. So these are all parameters which clearly say that uh, uh, some of our strategies are resonating well and uh, our level of engagement with most of our top and strategic clients have improving in the last 6-12 uh, months. So in your assessment, is this gain coming through with the, uh, by gaining market share from the other uh, India-based player or this is coming in versus the global peers? It is both, uh, uh, both from India based on this one, and particularly in the areas, for instance, if you look at uh, large deal, significant percentage of large deal wins is in the areas of uh, consulting, uh, sorry, um, cloud and infrastructure services. There it typically comes from uh, global players who are probably incumbents for the last five, ten years. But in other areas, uh, we have won, we have enough evidence of having won against uh, India based players as well. And lastly, just a question on the on the current quarter. Uh, based on, uh, I mean, of course, we have seen the full impact of Brexit now with almost uh, a month old. So, what kind of operational uh, changes that you have seen? I mean, basically, changes in the operative environment in the since in the quarter uh, to date, uh, which is different from what probably your expectation was going into the quarter. I think RBS, I mean, at the beginning of the quarter, RBS is a public knowledge. Uh, the ramp down in RBS, uh, which was uh, uh, one of the cause of uh, Brexit uh, thing, was clearly not seen at the beginning of quarter. So that is one clear example. And uh, in addition to that, we have seen some client-specific softness in, uh, uh, we can't attribute it to any specific industry, but at least we have seen in some few clients uh, some softness, which we didn't anticipate in the beginning of the quarter. And is it concentrated in UK alone, or is it something which you're seeing in in uh, US for also exam? It's uh, it's primarily in Europe, but we have seen. I mean, client specifics cuts across geography. We have had clients in uh, other parts of the world also where we have seen some softness. Sure. 
Sure. Thank you. Hi, it's Ankur from CLSA. Uh, just the first point on the guidance. I understand your comments and the lack of visibility right now. Just want to clarify one thing. Are you taking a policy stance that the guidance will only be updated every quarter along with results, and hence not updating it now despite the current uh, uh, you know change? Or is it more based on what you see in the market where you think you're comfortable with the full-year guidance? I think, uh, you know, as we have always said that whatever visibility that we have, we will say, it, as we shall re kind of reiterate it a couple of times in the morning opening address, he clearly stated that uh, uh, while some of the drag factors of Q1 we have put behind and we have addressed and at least uh, arrested some of those factors, at the same time, some of the things that uh, we had not anticipated when we gave guidance like uh, the impact of this RBS, et cetera. So there are both factors. At the same time, we, he also reiterated that some of the India projects, we see some momentum and things like that. So there is a combination and we have still, uh, you know, five weeks to go. So we want to give a more accurate picture on guidance after we execute Q2, after assessing uh, Q3 and Q4, we need to see whether RBS is, uh, one-off, are there more? And at this point in time, we can't say. Uh, there are uncertainties around it. So we need to execute while we, while he also reiterated that uh, our focus is on disciplined Q2 execution. We want to make sure that uh, while we are confident that Q2 execution uh, or the growth is better than Q1, we want to sh make sure how we end Q2. And by then, uh, we'll be in October, by then, the Q3 and Q4, uh, to what extent, uh, whether it is RBS is alone, more RBSs are, uh, whether it is uh, one of the pieces, and to what extent could be offset or not offset uh, those headwinds. We'll be in a much better and much uh, a certain position uh, by the time we come in October. Uh, so that is more like it than, uh, you know, uh, not uh, kind of uh, saying that, look, we will not do this or that. Understand. Just one, uh, you know, question on the large deals. Clearly, there's been a lot of success in the last couple of years, and you know, it, it's helpful to look at the company that way. But one of the things that we struggle as analysts to understand is what proportion of these large deals break up into net new deals versus renewals, uh, which gives us a better idea of you know how much of the guidance is supported by that. If you can give any color uh, towards that. No, that's a good point, Ankur. Uh, quarter on quarter, that composition varies. For example, uh, in the last quarter, uh, the proportion of the rebates was higher, uh, higher than 50% uh, in the last quarter, that is in Q1. However, if you look at the previous quarters, uh, it was probably more like 30 was uh, rebid and 70 was new. So we, the composition of the, the new versus the rebid varies from quarter to quarter. It is exactly depending upon what kind of deals get announced in that particular quarter. But on a, on a large basis, we do see uh, the rebates in the range of around 30 to 40 percent. What I mean rebid is really re rebidding our own work. At the same time, uh, we are already present in the client, but we are taking some portion of our competitors. That's also part of the rebate. So we have a mix of both. That's very helpful. And just, you know, lastly, uh, Vishal, I would like to know your views on consulting. You've seen consulting, you know, as a, as a technologist at SAP earlier, and you've seen that, you know, Infosys is one of the stronger consulting outfits out there here. Uh, given that consulting typically is viewed as one of the ways that companies who, uh, highlight innovation to the to, to, to the clients, uh, do you think, I mean, because your, your approach on innovation is different, you want to do it more grassroots, but I wanted to know how much of your focus is on consulting as well. And in that context, uh, we've seen some, uh, you know, perhaps a uh, um, minute part of elevated attrition earlier this year, which impacted your last quarter. Any thoughts on, you know, innovation is happening, but one part of consulting is not really doing well. So both your structural thoughts and the cyclical thoughts around that. That's a, that's a very good point, Akur. The, uh, um, so there is a the broad sense of consulting and how that, um, how that evolves. Rajesh is in, in Chicago. He couldn't join us here today. But um, uh, is he on the phone? It's the, it's the middle of the night, yeah. The, uh, uh, so broadly, what is there is broadly what is happening in consulting and the Infosys-oriented parts of it. And after Q1... Uh, I spent significant amount of time with the team and 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 so on. The uh, broadly, what is happening in consulting, as you said, is the uh, it has been around the idea of taking packages, taking existing best practices, and making them um, available to clients. So, looking at a client situation and comparing that to quote unquote best practices, 
and identifying areas of improvement and things like that. So this is basically generally what consulting has been about. One of the side effects of consulting is that typically consultants are uh, able to carry out conversations with the C-suite, with the corner offices, and, and that has a effect of elevating the conversation towards a more strategic kind of a conversation. Um, having said that, I think the world of today, the businesses of today are looking for a different kind of consulting. They're looking for ways of understanding on the one hand how to simplify and improve their landscape, but they're also looking for advice on next generation kinds of things that they need to do in order to survive and to thrive in the digital world and, and, and so on. So that needs a different kind of an approach that needs a uh, design thinking, a, a more con uh, consultative innovation kind of an approach, and that's the one that we want to focus on. So we are on a journey to transform our consulting towards that kind of, a, of an op or, or organization, which is then complemented downstream by the services organization that is a very innovative one. Um, which is where the grassroots comes in. So it is not only the grassroots, it is the grassroots in combination with the more disruptive innovation, with the more problem-finding, design-thinking kind of a work that we can do together with the client. So that is the general picture, and we will, we will get towards that. Now, an Infosys-specific situation on consulting is a very different one. We have, uh, we have had over the last uh, 12 years or so um, a, a U, primarily U.S.-oriented consulting arm uh, and then we acquired this com company called Lodestone, which was primarily an SAP-oriented consulting shop. So not only different cultures than Infosys, but also different cultures from each other. And this is what we have been working on integrating and transforming into this bigger vision that I laid out. Uh, now, the challenges that happened in Q1 in consulting were largely because of the fact that certain payment milestones were reached and a bunch of people left at the same time and, and certain clients ramped down and things like that. So these are things that... Uh, with a better handle on it, we could have uh, prevented, and uh, um, we are now taking steps to arrest that, the degrowth that we saw in consulting uh, in Q1. <laughs> Having said that, over a over the next several years, uh, we do um, um, we are working on, and we do expect to see consulting becoming a more significant part of elevating our conversation, going towards this uh, implementation of the renew a new strategy at clients, and helping become that tip of the spear that brings the rest of the company forward with that. And uh, it is a journey. Rajesh is now in charge of it. Uh, he's run, he's uh, uh, doing a great job of getting wired into the consulting organization, and I expect that we'll see continued progress in that direction. Yeah, this is a question on the senior manager attrition. I think uh, we have seen a bit of a volatility within Infosys in the last four to five years. Under the new leadership, I think this has been handled well. But of late in the last couple of quarters, I think there is a bit of an increase here. So apart from uh, involuntary reasons as well as the external opportunities, is there you know, one or two key findings or the learnings for Infosys and another new strategy of renew and new? Are you finding it really difficult in terms of a role replacement, either internally or externally? Uh, no, we are not finding it difficult at all. Uh, the uh, it is, uh, I would say that uh, bigger part of it is because of performance, and um, there are a couple of cases uh, where there are also people who saw bigger opportunities and so on. But by and large, uh, we have been. It is simply performance, and we. Um, we want to ensure that the company is executing well, and not only on the long-term path, but ensuring that continuous execution on an ongoing basis, and will continue to be, uh, you know, uh, acting in that in that sense. But I would like to, uh, Praveen or Ranga, have any more thoughts on that? No, I, uh, no, as I said, uh, I showed in my slide data on uh, title holders. Uh, because these are all senior leaders in the company, totally about 500, 550 people. So if you look at that attrition, that data, it is significantly very small percentage. We have probably not done a good job in terms of giving visibility to the next layers. Even under the precedents, we have got about 20 and odd regional heads who are really uh, running various segments and so on. Uh, so, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, when people get good opportunities, it's not every day people get a CEO kind of opportunities. The so people obviously try to grab that. 
Uh, but uh, by and large, I think we have enough management strength. And the way we view it is, uh, while well, we are sorry to see some of the people go, but we also view it as an opportunity for other people to step up to the plate and uh, they get an opportunity. So it's not a concern for us. And we'll continue to enable our people, um, uh, promote our people. At the same time, we'll also infuse talent from outside as well, because we need that uh, good mix uh, as we execute our strategy. Okay. Thank you. One more question, please. Last question. Yogesh. <laughs> yeah, hi. So this is Yogesh from HSBC. Uh, Vishal, you have been talking about automation, new age technologies, design thinking from day one. Uh, do you think at some point your growth will become relatively immune to near-term macro volatilities because you'll be able to gain market share more consistently and so any not near-term issues won't impact the growth? Yes, I, I do. I do, Yogesh. The, uh, we are not there yet because some of these new the so-called immune areas are not uh, at the scale yet that they can counter the downturns in other parts of the business. Uh, but we will get there. Um, the, uh, if you look at some of the software areas like Mana or Scava or Edge, these will be, and Sandeep will talk about this, um, these will be uh, um, buffers or uh, uh, will have give us the ability to guard against some of these uh, structural or seasonal declines and so on. I mean, if you look at the upcoming Q3, and traditionally there are these furloughs and, um, and you know, less number of working days and things like that, which is a, for a software guy, that is a kind of a strange concept because in the software industry, that quarter is the one where the largest number of license sales happen. Um, so, so, you know, over time we will, we'll get there, but today the bulk of the business is, um, uh, the traditional business. And, uh, even though we have seen tremendous growth in the new areas, I mean, last quarter, um, we saw more than 40% growth in the, uh, in the new areas quarter on quarter. Uh, the, it does, um, it, it will, it will take some time, but we, we, we will get there. And that is exactly the, um, our, that's the journey that we are on. You want to add something? Thank you. Actually, after this, uh, all the three presidents uh, will talk about MANA automation and the new services. They will take questions at the end of their session as well. Uh, we have a couple of demos coming up. Again, uh, around 2.30, the entire management team will be available for any open house and Q&A. Uh, Vishal, Praveen, myself, and all the presidents will be again available in the second half as well after you hear from the presidents on the progress of uh, uh, MANA automation and uh, uh, the sales effectiveness. Thank you.